I've been taking Manx lessons online with Ruth from Culture Van, and so I just wanted to introduce myself and Manx very briefly. Apologies, my pronunciation does trend towards Scottish Gaelic. Um, Fester Mai, Mishmeg Highland, um, Tommy Cumberland's Nalbin, as Tommy Manra, Jew, son Tommy Inns Manin. Um, Tafisum Dural Muran Skadvin and show um, Tamil Dare Dehaney, Guramayu. That's about as far as I can get in Thanks. <laughs> My pronunciations, I'll do my best, but between my American accent and being a speaker of Scottish Gaelic, apologies if I mispronounce any of the Minx place names. Um, so my talk tonight is called Little Rhymes in the Minx, Music and Hearing Workers in the Isle of Man. And what I'm going to be talking about is um, uh, Mona Douglas, who I'm sure needs no introduction to this audience, a major figure of the Minx or folk revival. Um, she made a few comments in her writings about music connected to herring work. And what I'm going to do is first introduce some of those comments she made, and then I'm going to talk about first the context of an area we know much more about, Scottish Gaelic gutting song. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the other evidence we have for um, singing and dance as part of the Manx herring industry. Um, can everybody hear me okay over the thingy? Everybody can hear me? Okay, great. Then I think we'll leave the ventilator on. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so I've got a couple quotes up here from Mona Douglas. All the images, by the way, except for the newspaper clippings you'll see later, all of these I've taken from the website of Makes National Heritage. Um, so uh, Mona Douglas um, spent the first 10 years of her life between a few different communities on the Isle of Man. And the relevant one here is Balarach. Is that how you say it? Balarach. Balarach. Okay, thank you. Germayu. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so she made a few comments about um, herring and song. And so the quotes up here, um, which I'll read out in a minute, um, it's about not the herring gutters who would travel from port to port, um, but it's about people who would gut and salt their herring just for home use over the winter in the Isle of Man. Because um, even though the herring industry boomed into a huge industry where Manx herring would be exported to the Baltic and Germany and places like that, um, there was a really significant home market for herring as well. And it was one of the main foods people would rely on in the winter. Um, and so she says here, um, Music was part of the everyday life of the old Manx people, and it continued so even until my childhood. Um, they always used to sing when they salted down the herrings for the winter. The cart used to come around from Peel and we bought herrings. Um, I remember when the farms were there on Balara, they used to go to each in turn. Then all the girls and women of the district would have two or three big tubs set out on the street um, or the farmyard, and they would sit around these tubs working to salt down the herrings. As they worked, they sang. They made little rhymes in the Manx about somebody making fun of somebody. There was one track that they used to sing about an old woman over 60 years old, and she just got married and didn't know much about men. Um, so this is the quote I found from Mona Douglas. Um, it was quoted in a book by Fenella Bazin called um, The Manx and Their Music. So Mona Douglas you know, is such a huge figure. Um, in the Manx folk revival, and um, while I'm sure there are people here who know much more about her than I do, um, you know, there seems to be a mixed reception of some of the claims she made, especially about the use of the Manx language and how prevalent it was, because it was obviously in a serious decline during her early childhood, and she was a major figure in reviving it. Um, so what I'm hoping to do with this talk is kind of look at it from several other angles so we can think about because um, this quote she said and how likely it seems compared to other evidence related to the <coughs> hearing industry. So if we just go to the next slide, um, the song she mentions, a 60-year-old woman who just got married and doesn't know what she's doing, is probably a real Manx song attested elsewhere, Shen Ven, um, which somebody was singing earlier when the slide was up. Mm -hmm. um, so a fisherman called Tom Kermode um, is the one who gave this song to Mona Douglas and then it was published um, in the Clegg Music Collection and some other places. Um, and so as you can see here, it's about a 64-year-old woman 
um, and who didn't really know much about marriage. And what's kind of interesting is that um, herring gutters in the northeast of Scotland, um, so up in Caithness, um, there's one woman who, um, Ambala, the Highlands Life Archive, did an interview with her, and she sang a music hall song called I'm 94 This Morning, which is about a very similar topic. Um, he goes like, I'm 94 this morning, I am 94 today. I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm getting old and gray, but my heart is fun. And it, no, my heart is young and it's full of fun, and I'm very proud to say I'll maybe get married on Thursday, though I'm 94 today. <laughs> so, you know, but when you've got... Um, work that's being done by young women, um, th this sort of song is the type of thing you would expect. And this is a song that is attested elsewhere. So um, in that respect, she's referencing a real make song there. And if we can just go to the next slide. Um, and then Fenella Basin, when she published that quote from Mona Douglas, she also included Juani Jagged Keir, um, Gray Jacketed John. And uh, again, this is like a well-attested make song, um, and in 1928, she wrote um, that she thought it was peculiar to the Isle of Man, as in particular to the Isle of Man. This type of song is actually extremely common in Scottish Gaelic as well, um, and, and so it shows that the Manx practice here was part of a much wider um, Gaelic practice, and um, you know, it's like a mocking song where you put in the names of different people. And so in this one, it's about teasing somebody for crying as a child. And um, in Scottish Gaelic songs associated with herring gutters, um, they're often teasing songs in Gaelic that are um, improvised to a set formula. If we go to the next slide. Oh, and there's one more, actually. Um, so this is the other one that um, Mona Douglas associates um, with the herring industry. Um, she says that she collected it from uh, Mrs. Shimon of Foxdale in 1921. Um, and then um, Gil Christ published it a year later. Um, and she says it's the good wish of a girl for her lover on the sea. Um, and the girls would be singing it when the boats would be away at the fishing. Um, so this is quite an unusual um, make <clears throat> song in a lot of respects. You know, this whole row, re row is a very um, Scottish Gaelic sounding refrain um, with a, you know, a walking song. It'll go, there'll be a line like this and then something like ho, ro, he, ro, that sort of stuff. Um, and so some scholars think that basically Mona Douglas made this up. And so, um, <laughs> so we'll come back to this one at the end. Um, so these are kind of the little pieces um, we have from Mona Douglas about makes song associated with women who worked um, closely with the industry, whether um, packing herring for themselves at home or being the women who, you know, worked on the harbor and would be waiting when the fishermen um, went out. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, so now I'd just like to give you a brief overview of um, what my master's research was about. And I've just had an article come out about this in Scottish Studies, which is Scottish Gaelic song. Um, in the herring industry, because although scholars hadn't really looked at this before, there's a lot of evidence um, of songs in oral history archives in Edinburgh and Canna and some other places of songs that um, herring gutters from the Hebrides composed themselves. And these songs are particularly associated with the Isle of Lewis, um, which a lot of young women in the late 19th and first half of the 20th centuries a lot of young women from Lewis worked in the herring industry. And what it was to be an itinerant herring gutter, in case you're not familiar with it, is, um, you know, the herring would move. So they'd start down here by the Isle of Man um, around May, and then it would go up around the north of Ireland and um, the Hebrides, and then up to Shetland. I'm not sure if I'm doing this the right way for where you're looking, but it would go up to Shetland and, um, and then down the east coast of Scotland and England, ending in places like Yarmouth in November time. Um, and so the fishermen would be on the boats following the herring shoals over this period, um, but huge thousands and thousands of women would have to follow the herring as well. So they would either take boats to the fishing ports or sometimes special trains would be set up for them. And so they would also move from port to port because they had to be ready, herring rots very quickly um, and so you, if you want to pack it for export, they had to be ready right away when the fish landed um, to gut it and pack it into barrels. 
Um, and, you know, they could be working as late as like two in the morning sometimes because they just had to do as, as much hearing as there was. They just had to keep doing it. And so uh, a lot of women would sing while they were doing this work. Um, and the women who spoke Scottish Gaelic as their native language, oh, is it okay? Yes, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, would compose new songs in Gaelic. So there's a genre of Gaelic song, Horstabil, um, mouth music, which does have a Manx equivalent, um, but is much better attested in Scottish Gaelic. And that's um, literally music out of, tunes out of the mouth. And so that's when you sing to accompany dancing. And, you know, Gaelic speaking women from the Hebrides were used to singing while working during things like milking and walking the tweed, but those songs were really too slow for the gutting work because, I mean, women could gut a fish a second sometimes. That's how fast they could work. And so they needed much faster music, and so they would sing dance music. And so what you usually have is a generic formula, like, oh, um, my lover, he, um, the strait between Bernera and Uick, that's in Lewis, is separating us because he's away for the fishing. Or things like, um, you know, uh, the cows are kept up all night because my lover's always coming to visit, like things like this. And so there'd be a generic formula, but then women would improvise new lyrics. Um, and usually in a kind of a teasing way to pair up their fellow workers with some of the fishermen. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of reminiscent of what we were talking about with Juani Jagged Kier, um, where you're kind of improvising these kind of mocking, playful songs. Um, and they're usually love songs, um, and they're often uh, very dirty. <laughs> and I'm not a native Scottish Gaelic speaker, and sometimes this one I'm going to play you, um, when I play it, some people are like, that's really blue. <laughs> like, you don't even realize. And I'm like, oh boy. So <laughs> there might be some innuendos in there that'll go over our heads. But um, another really interesting thing about Scottish Gaelic gutting song is that um, it shows a really strong influence of English and Scots music. Um, so like in the one I'm going to play for you, you know, she uses English words like um, gangway, um, private, for like a privately owned boat. Um, she uses a lot of English words. And this makes sense because a lot of women, even though they had English in school, it wasn't until they went to the fishing that they actually had to speak it really. Um, and the fishing industry was dominated by um, companies from lowland Scotland. Um, and this was true all over. So in the Isle of Man as well, you know, the Scottish cures really dominated the industry. Um, and then you also have um, the refrains, like you'll hear of this song, are different than a lot of Gaelic refrains because they sound a lot more like diddling, like, oh, diddle, oh, diddle, lady, um, that kind of thing. Um, and there's lots of interesting details in these songs that I don't have time to go into now, but in Scottish Gaelic, you have women often singing about how they don't like the traditional housing in the Hebrides, and now that they've seen modern housing in places like Lairwick um, in England, uh, they want their boyfriends to build that for them when they come back home from the fishing. Um, so there's lots of interesting details in here. And so then, um, Chloe, if we could just get this um, song up. Um, this one's sung by Mary Morrison of Barra, who was a hearing gutter, and she improvised um, a ton of verses to this gutting song, just to give you a sense of what it sounded like. She <laughs> Right, so that gives you a sense, you know, it's hard not to tap your feet while you're listening to that. So you can see how this was dance music. And this particular song is still sung at Kaylee's. Um, in Scotland, like uh, Anne Lorne Gillies in her Songs of Gaelic Scotland said she'd heard it sung 
instead of about a fisherman, about a policeman in Glasgow. So you can see how these songs would just continue to be improvised on the formula. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to go through a couple of different quotes um, and sources I found about music among herring workers in the Isle of Man. Um, so this is something I've been working on um, not as long as the Scottish material. So afterwards, you know, I'll be very interested in um, if anybody has anything else they want to add or comment on. Um, but the first thing here is a, there was an interview that I think Culture Vannon did with um, Captain Harry Kinley. Um, and he, I'll just read out this quote here. Um, the fishermen on a Saturday, they'd be out there with their little concertinas on a Sunday evening singing hymns, and the fisher girls with their gansies um, dancing or singing hymns. My anyway. If you'd, and all the people would join them, us kids, we used to join them, you see, singing our little heads off, singing hymns and whatnot, and what a sight that was, to see them fisher girls down there in their jerseys and whatnot, singing and dancing on a Sunday evening, and this is the gutter girls, they used to call them. So this is him talking about his childhood in, um, let me just make sure I get the town right, um, Port St. Mary. Um, so the, what he's talking about would have been around the 1910s and 1920s. Um, so there's a couple different aspects um, to talk about here um, as it relates to what I've found about Scotland. Um, so hymn singing among gutters was extremely common, particularly in the northeast of Scotland. Around 1921 was a terrible fishing year. And there's a woman called Frances Wilkins at Aberdeen who's written a great book about this. Um, this evangelical fervor just swept through the northeast fishing communities of Scotland. So places like Peterhead, Fraserburgh, Bucky, and... Um, so women um, there started singing hymns while they were doing the gutting. And at the time, it was a sign of kind of their religious commitment, like, oh, we want to glorify God through everything we're doing. Um, other cases of people singing hymns, it was more just that was the songs people knew. Um, and so in any particular case, you can't necessarily say it's a strong sign of religious commitment, but it was certainly... A big deal in the northeast of Scotland, um, which is interesting because in Scottish Gaelic it would have been considered taboo to sing um, religious music uh, during this kind of work. Um, so, you know, they were extremely religious on an island like Lewis, but they weren't singing hymns. Um, well, they don't have hymns in Gaelic anyway, but so that's an interesting connection there um, to what Harry's describing um, a, a good connection to the northeast of Scotland. Um, another thing that I like here is how he talks about um, how the fishermen had the concertinas. And um, Bucky Historical Society did some great interviews with herring gutters and fishermen in the 1980s. And they talked about how the fishermen weren't supposed to have instruments on the boat, but they would usually smuggle them anyway um, to accompany exactly this kind of thing. The dances they would have with the women, um, usually Saturdays and Sundays, um, because they didn't fish on Sunday. Um, and so that's another nice connection. Um, you know, usually I hadn't come across any references to concertinas being used. Usually you see them talking about smuggling, um, button melodians and little accordions. So, um, that's a nice detail. Um, the thing about this that's most different from the Scottish material is that these dances took place outside in Port St. Mary. Um, he said next to a church, uh, I'm not sure if it's still there. Um, and so outdoor dances were not as common in Scotland. Um, people in Shetland, um, the, the women, the fish workers were provided with their own accommodation and they would usually host kind of impromptu kaleys in their huts. Um, and then uh, in other places, um, sometimes like again in Shetland at the end of the season, they usually have a big foy is what they call it in Shetland, a big kind of musical party. And that would be in one of the cooperage sheds. The coopers are the ones who make the barrels. And, um, and then in places like Yarmouth, um, where they were just staying in people's houses, they couldn't host dances in other people's houses, but they would usually go to dance halls. Um, so this is really cool hearing about how they would just kind of gather outside in Port St. Mary 
um, and do the dances. It reminds me a little bit of, um, in Iceland, um, the herring industry was also huge in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and um, the Icelandic women would often dance on the quay at night. Oh, well, we're about to go to the next slide anyway. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, um, you know, the main difference there, there's a lot of connections to what Scottish workers were doing, but um, the outdoor dances um, in the Isle of Man is something I haven't come across much elsewhere in Britain and Ireland. Um, so here's uh, some quotes from Albert Frost, who was also interviewed by Culture Bannon. Um, this was an interview from just 2020, I think. Um, and he worked in the, uh, his father was a chemist, and he still lives in Peel, so I'm sure some of you know him. And uh, he said his job was um, to spray perfume in his father's shop after the gutters left because they smelled so bad. <laughs> and he very gleefully explained to me on the phone the exact dimensions of the perfume bottle. Um, and so he talked about how in Peel, um, and this would be, we're kind of, um, this is right around the same time of Perry Kinley, but a little bit later. This is um, the 1930s and 40s in Peel. Um, he talked about how the fish girls would go to big dances at the Marine Hall, which I'm told is there's a swimming pool that's closed there now. Um, and so they, and they, he says they'd go on Monday night, which is different than anything I found in Scotland. Um, but it just has to do with the timing of when they shoot the nets and bring the fish in. Um, and he says since they, he criticized the lack of bathing facilities and said they'd have this scent and you'd get over there, the red hot heat in the summer where they're all packed in there with the band going. And it was just like being in a kipper house with the smell of kippers and herring. <laughs> and this is something that you see commented on in the Scottish material a lot, is the smell of the girls. And it's interesting because um, in the Fisheries Museum in, uh, up in Anstruther, which is where I live, in Fife in Scotland, um, they've got some quotes on the wall from different herring gutters who talk about how they tried so hard to scrub the smell out um, before they went to the dances, but there was just nothing they could do because they'd been, you know, gutting bloody fish all day. So um, they said they would try to get the scales out of their hair before they went to the dance, but it didn't always work. Um, let's just see if there's anything else I want to say about this one. Yeah, no, just that... Um, Again, this is really similar to what you find in Scotland, um, although it, it's interesting, you know, the local difference that here the dances would have been on Mondays. Okay, next slide, please. Just get a little water. Okay, so here we've got, and um, this is from 1947, I think. Governor? Yeah, um, so this is a, uh, the Lieutenant Governor of the Isle of Man um, visited uh, a kippering yard. Um, and you can see, so these are some fish girls at Peel who were photographed with the governor. And it says, um, and this is from a Manx newspaper, um, the party went to the CWS premises in charge of Mr. Walter Scholes, and then to a young Manx man's premises where they were met by Mr. Dennis, uh, yeah. McAvoy. 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 Yeah. McAvoy. McAvoy. Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry. <laughs> um, the proprietor. They watched the girls splitting herrings by hand, accompanied by some jazz tunes, for these girls kept on singing as they worked. So this is an interesting quote. It's hard to know exactly what they mean by jazz in 1947. Um, that could cover a big variety of types of music. Um, but it seems to imply that the women were listening to the radio um, while working in the kippering. And this is a really interesting um, little detail from this newspaper article because I found it's much harder to find um, published accounts um, about uh, women, what their experience was like working in the Kippering Yards, which obviously in the Isle of Man was extremely important. Um, was also done in Northern Ireland and some other places. Um, but obviously a famous part of the Manx herring is the Kipper. Um, and so you, I haven't found many references um, to people listening to the radio, which is what I assume they mean by the jazz tunes. It could also be a record player um, because most herring gutting was done outdoors, right? So there is a, there was an article um, from 1937 about a Scottish cure in Yarmouth who would blast the radio on the um, kind of like loudspeakers. But in general, um, it's much easier 
to provide music to an indoor workspace. Um, so that is interesting evidence um, and showing that the women were singing along to it. Uh, when they say jazz tunes, um, you know, sometimes that implies a lack of lyrics, so it's hard to know um, if the women are just singing along to the lyrics as they're hearing them or if they're coming up with their own. We just don't have enough detail from this little quote. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is something I wanted to talk about. Um, I'd love to do more research on these Herring Queen pageants. Um, I've been to one, Richard Weems, who's here, um, revived the one in Cellardyke in Fife. So I've been to one, but um, for a while in kind of the 50s, these were huge um, in, certainly in Scotland um, and England and here in the Isle of Man as well in Peel. Um, I'm sure there are people here who know more about um, the Peel pageant than I do, because some of you might have gone to it. Um, but so I just wanted to comment, there was an interesting quote here in a newspaper in 1955 um, about the crowning of the queen because um, usually a woman would be crowned, a young woman would be crowned as the herring queen, and then there'd be all sorts of processions and parties, and she'd give an address kind of about how she hopes there'll be good fishing this year. And um, then the following day, she'd have what in Scotland we would call her kirking, um, where there's like a religious service about it to kind of bless the fishing industry for that year. And so um, it says here that um, the children of the clockworkers school in Peel um, put on an enjoyable pageant depicting old customs of the fishermen and their women folk. The men going to sea on the fishing boats, while the women danced on the breakwater under the walls of the old castle. And this is really interesting because it remind it could just be, you know, the Manx Dance Society was involved in organizing this. So it could have just been, you know, dancing because it's like a festive thing on the Isle of Man in the 1950s, um, so of course you'd have dancing. But this does remind me a little bit of Harry Kinley talking about the outdoor dancing um, in Port St. Mary. Um, and so, you know, they talk about how they were trying to act out, they were having the children act out the customs of the adults. Um, and so it's possible, you know, this is not proof that there was dancing outside in Peel to do with the herring, but it's interesting um, that that was part of it. Next slide, please. Okay, and so the last one I wanted to talk about here um, was the royal visit in 1955 of Queen Elizabeth um, and Prince Philip. So her parents, the King and Queen, um, George, King George VI, had visited 10 years earlier, um, and they were given like a tour of the Manx Kippering Yards in Peel, and um, they would get sent, the Queen Mother talked about how she would get sent um, Manx Kippers once a week in the height of the season to Buckingham Palace. Um, and so, you know, when, when the, a royal tour like this was happening and they would come to Peel, the Kippering was one of the main things to show them. And so this is from 1955 when Queen Elizabeth came. And it says, as the royal car moved towards the harbor where the fishing fleet was in, with the blue jersey crews lining the small decks, a group of Scottish herring girls were singing the old friendly tune of their country, we're no awa to bide awa, we'll all come back and greet ya. And so this is interesting because obviously it's something that's been arranged, right? Like the royal tour was meticulously planned. Um, so this has been arranged to kind of show off um, uh, what Peel does. And the, the idea that the Scottish herring girls were a part of the attractions of Peel is something that I've seen in kind of early 20th century tourist literature. Um, so there'd be magazine articles like, um, don't just go to Douglas, come to Peel and see our, the buxom Scottish lasses <laughs> get in the hair. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, sometimes um, tourists in the Isle of Man, they would take bets. They would, like, pick a gutter and be like, okay, I bet this one can get 50 fish a minute. And the other guy's like, oh, well, my gutter's going to be faster than that. And the women would kind of, like, banter back and forth with them. So they weren't just kind of just being observed. They were also kind of participating. Um, and so then the women would be competing um, to see which one of them could be faster for the tourists. Um, and there's a film clip um, from the 1930s, which I think was about the visit of some prince to um, Yarmouth or Lowestoft, somewhere in England. And that video includes kind of a shot of herring gutters, a few shots of herring gutters packing the fish into barrels. And um, the Bonnie Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond is playing over the um, clip. 
And so there does seem to be this sense of kind of like, oh, when it's time to present the fishing industry to people, this is an attractive part of it, these singing Scottish women. Um, even though it's interesting that they emphasize the Scottishness, because there were Manx women working in the industry as well, and English and Irish, um, but obviously it was dominated by Scottish workers, and the Scottishness of it was apparently part of the appeal. Um, and having said that about kind of the artificial aspects, um, in the northeast of Scotland, when they weren't singing hymns, they were often just singing kind of Scottish folk songs. Um, Zetta Sinclair, who's the mother of Isla Sinclair, who was a folk singer, um, she was a gutter, excuse me, up in like uh, Fraserburgh or somewhere like that. And, you know, she would say, yeah, they would take like kind of just whatever songs they knew and they would speed up the tempo to match the gutting. And so that aspect of the tempo isn't represented in these royal presentations. Um, but it, you know, it's unclear. Nobody, we don't know if the women were told to sing this song or if they just picked it among themselves. Um, and it's obviously kind of, you know, sentimental because the queen loves Scotland and all that. Um, so yeah, so those are my examples. Um, so now I'm just gonna take it back to the question we started with at the beginning. Um, about Mona Douglas and how well um, does the evidence we have of, first of all, Scottish Gaelic gutting song, second of all, musical practice among herring gutters in the Isle of Man, how well does that fit with what Mona Douglas said? And I think I'd like to split it into two categories. So first are Shen Ven and Juani Jagat Peer, um, the songs that she says that when she was a little girl she would hear people um, singing while they were packing and salting the herrings. And from, even though you can't take everything Mona Douglas says at face value, those two songs do seem to fit in really well with the Scottish Gaelic practice. Um, again, even though one of these was kind of more domestic and the other was more industrial, the Scottish Gaelic stuff, um, I think that it, you know, it sounds pretty reasonable that this may have been something that um, young Manx women were, or old Manx women, because, you know, by that point, the Manx language wasn't as commonly spoken by young people, but old women would have been also at the tub soldering <coughs> down the herring for the winter. Um, so I think that is actually quite plausible that Mona, that might be a genuine memory from, oh, from her child, I guess we don't really need that up. <laughs> a genuine memory from her childhood and um, that Mona Douglas is talking about. Again, like I said, Shen Ben matches in other languages, the kinds of stuff that these women like to sing about. And Juani Jagged Kier with the improvisation like, oh, I'm going to stick in the name of such and such to make fun of them. That's like exactly what they were doing in Scottish Gaelic. The other one, actually, maybe we can go back to the slide with the sea invocation up. That's towards the beginning. Do you think that'd be all right? Because um, that one, I, you know, is a little trickier. Um, this is the one. Obviously, this is a very beautiful song. I've listened on YouTube to all sorts of beautiful versions um, in Manx that people have um, composed of it. So what I'm about to say is not a diss on the song. I love the song. But, um, you know, there are some things about it that don't fit in quite so well. So the first thing is the Scottish style vocables. Um, you know, some I'd be interested what other people had to say. Um, I have not come across any examples of Manx song in my own research that have these kinds of vocables um, with the whole row hero. Um, it may have existed because you do find some in Irish, although it's much less common. Um, so it may have been that this kind of repertoire of nonsense syllables um, was shared, um, you know, beyond Scotland. But I, I'm not sure yet about whether that really matches. Um, there's no S Scottish version of this song. Um, so it's not as if, you know, she's taken a Scottish Gaelic song and translated it into Manx. I have never found a Scottish version of this particular song. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, the context she describes for when she says Mrs. Shimon told her people would sing this song, um, you know, women singing kind of about their love and kind of sad but hopeful when the boats are away. Um, this kind of slower, more mournful song does have a parallel in Scottish Gaelic as well. Um, they weren't singing those kinds of songs while they were gutting the fish because they were too slow. Um, but you do have kind of slow songs like Opahoka, Siam, and Yadak. 
um, which is kind of by a, high, a Lewis girl who's worried that her boyfriend's gone away to the fishing and he's going to be, they're going to take advantage of him because he's a Highlander who doesn't speak English. Like, so you do get um, those sorts of songs. Um, let's see. Uh, and in terms of like, like, okay, if this was a Manx song influenced by Scottish Gaelic, like I said, we do have um, examples in Scottish Gaelic of English songs changing the vocables of Scottish songs. So, like in that Mary Morrison song, you know, the refrain goes, Oh, did a low, did a lady, I'm see, oh, did a low, did a lady, I'm. And that's not a very Gaelic sounding refrain. That's very influenced by Scots music. Um, so, you know, diddling in Scots, um, it's like to do a fiddle tune, you can teach it to somebody by just singing. Um, the rhythm. Um, so, you know, it is possible, um, particularly in the 19th century, um, which is much more poorly documented, but had more Manx speakers, um, it is possible that, you know, Manx speakers were working alongside with Scottish Gaelic speakers had some sort of like linguistic ex exchange and influence on each other. Um, so, uh, you know, the scholars, um, like I said, some people think she just completely made it up. I have a hard time saying that because, you know, it's such a beautiful song and, and it does fit in. And it's like, am I going to call Mrs. Shimon a liar? Like, I don't really want to do that. Um, but, it, you know, this song is a little trickier. You know, that doesn't take away from the fact that for many decades now, it's been a wonderful part of the Manx tradition. Um, but I, I am more skeptical about Mona Douglas's claims about this song um, and its connection to the industry than Shen Ben and Joanny Jagged Pier. But that's just my take. Um, I'm very grateful to you for listening, um, Gurmayu, and I'd be interested to hear. If anybody really disagrees with me, don't worry, I can take it. But <laughs> I'd love to see if anybody has any questions now. Thank you.